Hey everyone, do you enjoy arguing with flat earthers? Me neither, so today we're going to cause a bit of pain to ourselves and respond to a flat earther. Oh boy, what could possibly be in store for us today? Now let's talk about planets. People always ask me, why is Earth the only planet that's flat? And it's simple, really. It's because Earth is not a planet. I think I've mentioned this before at some point. I think saying something like, why is the Earth the only planet that's flat is a bad argument. Come on, we're dealing with flat Earthers here. If they reject everything else about what science has said regarding the shape of the Earth, why would they believe the Earth is a planet? When dealing with flat Earthers, you really, really have to see it from their point of view. In other words, you have to try to anticipate what they would think or respond to an argument before you present it. Of course they wouldn't accept that the Earth is a planet. Of course they wouldn't accept that the Earth is in any category similar to the other planets in the solar system. Because if they did accept that, they would have a whole bunch of arguments to address, so of course it's easy to reject them all. I mean, I know that if I were a flat earther, I wouldn't think the earth is a planet either. That's why I never use this argument when talking to flat earthers. Instead, it's better to present actual evidence. Planets were known to the ancients as wandering stars. Let's have a look at the etymology of the word. This is from the online etymology dictionary. Wandering stars. See, that's what you need to pay attention to. Wandering stars. That's what these were called. Planets. And we weren't a c considered a wandering star. Now let's keep going. I hate it when people bring up some sort of definition or origin of a word's meaning as a way to back up a position they have. Because at the end of the day, that would just be semantics. Who cares what a word used to mean in the past? Who cares what our ancestors meant when they used the word planets for the first time? If anything, that would show the flaw in our language rather than anything else. For example, the word awful has a pretty negative meaning attached to it, but it used to mean the opposite. Its origin means full of all awful, and actually meant good instead of bad. But over time, this meaning changed, and that's the case for literally every word in the English dictionary. Nothing has retained its original meaning. I mean, heck, English didn't even come from itself. It changed drastically over the years due to influences from Latin, French, Dutch, etc. So it's absolutely silly to be pointing to the past meaning of a word and claim that planets are wandering stars because that's what the word used to mean. From planets die to wander, so-called because they have apparent motion unlike the fixed stars, originally included also the sun and moon. At this point, you're just redefining a word that is different than our modern definitions, and then trying to categorize things which somehow proves the position of the Earth being flat. I'm sorry, but that's not how any of this works. The word planet has a very specific scientific definition, a celestial body that orbits a star, and to qualify to become a planet, you have to be a certain size. Here are the actual three official criteria from the International Astronomical Union that defines what a planet is. It must be a celestial body that, first, is in orbit around the sun, second, has sufficient mass for its self-gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a hydrostatic equilibrium shape. That means that the pressure gradient forces are balanced out by gravity, so in layman terms that means the object retains a stable round shape. And finally, clearing the neighborhood around its orbit. Clearing the neighborhood just means there are no celestial bodies of similar size in its gravitational proximity. Now of course, under the flat earther's perspective, these criteria mean nothing because they don't even believe in gravity, so it's useless to bring this up. But in the eyes of science, this is specific enough for us to properly classify planets. The earth is a perfect example of a planet because it meets all three conditions, as well as any other planet in the solar system. So yes, under strict definitions, the Earth is a planet. Do you see the difference between how science and conspiracy theory works now? In science, our definitions are incredibly precise and allows us to draw a clear line between what is or is not a planet. Meanwhile, the words wandering stars is useless. It doesn't tell us exactly what that is, it doesn't help us classify celestial objects, and most importantly, it is vague. Because at the end of the day, pseudoscience and conspiracy theorists simply cannot do anything even remotely scientific. They rely on ambiguity because it gives them room to make mistakes and allows them to reinterpret words to fit their narrative. Incredibly dishonest if you ask me. Okay, so they move in a completely different way than the regular uniform stars that all move the exact same. Okay, so I guess you don't actually see the sun and moon as wandering stars because their path is fixed. So at this point, you're just using the word wandering however you like. This proves my point exactly on vague terminology. There's no way that wandering under anyone's definition would specifically tell us their path is not fixed. But the flat earther uses it this way, and a lot of people might buy that. But in reality, you have to take a step back and notice that they just redefined a term in a seemingly arbitrary way in order to support the flat earth narrative. So stupid. You can find the planets of the universe encoded in our weekdays. Sunday is sun. Monday is moon. Tuesday is Mars. Wednesday is Mercury. Thursday is Jupiter. Friday is Venus. Saturday is Saturn. All seven wandering stars are accounted for. You're probably wondering about Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Well, as you may know, Pluto was demoted from planet status in 2006, and there is much debate online as to whether Uranus and Neptune should even be considered. What? 
Who in the world has questioned if Uranus and Neptune are planets or not? Of course they're planets, it's not even a debate. Well, as usual, I was curious, so I found the article in the middle there, and it's clearly some sort of April Fool's joke or something. I'm just going to read a paragraph or two so you know that this was clearly written as a joke. We're making headway on chucking Pluto, so we thought we would keep going, said one of the scientists, who spoke from his bunker in the hotel basement on the condition of anonymity. Before long, we'll be back to the solar system of Ptolemy. We would go after Neptune, but we can never find the damn thing, he added. In fact, we're not even sure it exists, so no bother. You cannot even see Uranus without an artificial telescope, which is cheating, one of the scientists said. These people had no clue what they were doing back in 1781 when Uranus was discovered using this despicable method of seeing things. If God wanted us to use telescopes, we would have been born with them sticking out of our eyes. Oh, oh, here's a good one. The proposal to get rid of Uranus will be attached as an amendment to the plan to get rid of Pluto, to be voted on later in the week. We're going to get rid of both, said Dr. Melvin Peabody of Yale's Bush Observatory. When these two things get together, they cause nothing but trouble. We heard enough of them back during the French Revolution and the 60s, he said. So yeah, as you can see, the Flat Earthers can't even read the articles they're citing because just one paragraph shows that it's a joke. Need I say more? So yeah, Uranus and Neptune are definitely planets. Your attempt to align the sun in each planet to the days of the week is just ridiculous. Now let's have a look at what we are told the solar system looks like. Central sun, hence heliocentric, and the planets all going around it. Now just like pictures of the Earth, you can't find any real pictures of the so-called solar system. How in the world are you supposed to have a picture of the solar system? The solar system is 287 billion kilometers in diameter. How can you even get a camera to zoom out that far while still being able to see everything? It's the same reason we can't get a picture of Yo Mama. You flat earthers seem to only care about picture evidence. Oh, show us a picture of this, show us a picture of that. Oh, this picture is photoshopped, blah blah blah. How about you learn some math and science, because most of what we know came from calculations. Here's what you get when you do a search for real pictures of the solar system. A bunch of cartoons. <laughs> they actually tried to look up real pictures of the solar system. The Earth is officially classified as an oblate spheroid meaning that it's bulging at the equator and it's flattened out at the poles. Here's a short clip with Neil deGrasse Tyson. So Earth throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere, it's, an, it's oblate. And officially it's an oblate spheroid, that's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear-shaped. So apparently it's a pear-shaped oblate spheroid. Sounds fine to me, but there seems to be issues when NASA puts out images of the Earth. They're always perfect spheres, and some of these are claimed to be single shots. Just because it's an oblate spheroid or pear-shaped does not mean you can tell the difference through a satellite image. It's incredibly, incredibly subtle that you can't immediately notice, but if you actually take the measurements, you'd be able to tell. The difference of the Earth's diameter at the equator is about 43 kilometers greater than that from pole to pole. The Earth's average diameter is about 12,700 kilometers, a little more. A bit of division, and you'll see that the 43 kilometer difference is approximately 0.3%. Of course you wouldn't be able to see it from an image of the Earth. It's 0.3% for the love of God. This brings me back to the point of you flat earthers relying on nothing but visuals. There are plenty of other ways to know something without just looking at it. Not only that, but the images that NASA gives us are never really consistent. Here's three separate NASA images of the Earth, and North America is a different size on each one. Flat earthers claim they know so much about perspective but can't seem to understand the basics of it. And yes, this is indeed an instance of perspective. Allow me to explain. The size of the continents will change depending on your distance from the earth, and this applies only to objects with depth or are three-dimensional. The closer you are to the earth, the larger the continents will look. Here's an image I found on the internet that shows exactly my point. As you move closer to an object, the percentage distance between the camera and North America shrinks faster than the distance percentage to the horizon, and the sizes that our eyes and our cameras see is based off a proportion of distances. In film, we take advantage of this to create some pretty interesting illusions, such as the pullback zoom, where we zoom in or out at a speed equivalent to the speed of the camera's movement. I used to be a film student, so this is fascinating to me. I'll give you another relatable example if you close your eyes and imagine. Let's say you're standing in the middle of a street, and in front of you is a building. Behind that building is a bigger building. If you walk forwards a significant distance, then the first building will cover more of the second building in your perspective compared to before you walked forwards. And eventually, if you keep walking, you won't be able to see the second building at all because it is completely covered. It's the same concept here 
atmosphere for three-dimensional objects. As you get closer to the Earth, the apparent size of the continent on Earth seems to increase faster than the edges or horizons of the Earth. If you move further, the opposite will happen. Therefore, the sizes of the continents on Earth in relation to the overall size of the Earth, according to our camera, is dependent on how far away you are. Going back to your pictures here, the image in the middle is clearly taken at a closer distance, while on the right it is further away. Another way you can think of it is, if you're on the Earth itself, technically everything in your vision below you is the continent, but also the entire Earth itself. As you get higher, the land shrinks, while your perspective of the entire Earth does not shrink as fast. Same idea for satellite pictures. The Earth is special and so are you. We are at the center of all things, and the only life is here. Outer space is one big lie. Seems a bit narcissistic to me if you truly believe that we are in the center of the universe. Well, whatever. You can think you're special and all, but we all know that's not true. In the perspective of the universe, you are the same as anything else. Nothing more, nothing less. Thank you for watching, and thank you to my patrons, Fireshard, Alan Morton, and Miss Fixit. I'll see you in the next one.